during Advent season, we have the chance to really focus on those things that are most important. Um, the peace, the love, the joy uh, that comes from a relationship with God. And it doesn't matter what order we pick. Um, they're all good themes for the, the entirety of the calendar year. And um, if it ever still bothers you, the idea that, um, that Christmas, you know, can, can be kind of a, a time of materialism or a time when uh, people go about it for the wrong reasons, there's no doubt, you know, that that happens with any celebration that happens with the 4th of July, that happens with Memorial Day, that happens with anything. Um, but whenever the world says, hey, let's celebrate something about Jesus, then, hey, I'm in. So the, uh, the concept of celebrating God coming to earth in the form of a, a human being is just amazing. And it was not simply to remove a penalty. It was not just to uh, remove the, the, the results of sin. It was to restore relationship. It was to restore our time, our, our, our being, our shared being with God. <clears throat> and the only result of that can be joy because he is literally the fulfillment of our needs. He's the fulfillment of our, our deepest desires for companionship, for love, for for sympathy, for empathy, for anything that we can need, it's all found in God. And we experience those as a result of that relationship with him. And so I wanted to title this, uh, this is a, a week that we look at in Advent, we look at joy and its importance. And it occurs to me that you've got to have guts to, to experience joy, to go after it, and to say, this is something that I want and I'm willing to experience. And that might sound counterintuitive. It might sound like, how on earth does it take courage to, to feel joy? Well, in today's world, I think that it takes courage to feel just about anything. And that's for a number of reasons. But Often when we experience a positive state of mind, a positive emotional state, a positive well-being uh, in our soul, almost immediately a fear comes up that this probably won't last or something else will come along and take it away. Or I'm afraid that someone else, some other person or group will interfere and they will it will hurt me and it will come to an end. And so to, to have the audacity, to have the, the boldness, the guts to say, joy and love and peace are within reach and I'm going to grasp and hold on to them. It takes some, some courage and it takes a, a, an intentionality. It means that we have to say, it's not going to just come on its own. I have to let it in. These are things that Jesus offers. And if I resist because I'm afraid that they will go away, that's a bit like saying I'm not going to eat any food because I'm afraid I'll run out. You know, that you, you must participate. And then God provides the, the continuous stream for our needs. But for us to be afraid of, of it going away because we've been hurt before, well, that's to completely cut off your nose to spite your face. It's a matter of we are not living where we are meant to live. So I chose this picture because I love this little guy. You can see in his face that he is absolutely uh, uh, just in the moment. You know, yes, it's a summer picture and, uh, you know, this is winter, but it's a, it's a beautiful representation to me of all he's thinking about at the moment is the spray of water and how much fun he's having. And as adults, often we long for that kind of simple existence. And yet, what does Jesus tell us? The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So to me, that is a full-throated endorsement for a simple kind of living where we do seek after joy embrace it when it comes along 
and we don't live in fear that it's going away. And we don't let our, our previous wounds and our, our, our bad experiences make us think about an end to it, but rather to realize that we as human beings were meant to experience joy as a result of our relationship with God. So again, with Advent this year, our first and second weeks, we covered hope and peace. And this week, we're going to talk about joy itself. And then week four, we talk about the love of God. This is a quick reminder of what we look for with Advent. Number one, we talk about the incarnation itself, the original Advent, Jesus becoming kind of the original missionary, uh, crossing a border from heaven to earth uh, to, to bring about complete reconciliation. Uh, secondly, it's our, the indwelling of God. It, it's Christ in us. It is the Holy Spirit working in us and living in us. God says, I, I will make my home with you. And so there, that is kind of a second level of that advent, that indwelling. And the third, of course, is that Jesus said he will come again. And so that is something that we look forward to. But for right now, what I want to continue to emphasize is this process of renewal, this process of revival when it comes to us leaning into that relationship that Jesus offers. When we talk about prayer practices, when we talk about just going for a walk and praying and sharing things with God, when we talk about lowering the bar of, of what is urgent enough to bring before God, these are elements of renewal and revival where our soul finds its home again in God. So I want us to really think about that with this Advent season, the indwelling, this second layer of Advent means everything to us. And I'm I can't tell you how excited I am at the prospect of all of us, myself included, to, to double down on our relationship with God and to really lean into it because he is really leaning into us. I want to do something that um, I haven't tried before technically, and uh, I hope it will work fairly well. Um, if not, I, I hope you'll forgive any kind of glitches, but it's going to be kind of audience participation. And of course, completely voluntary. Um, this is the simple kind. You don't need to bare your soul. You don't need to share anything um, that you don't want to. Um, I'm, going to um, I'm going to make it so that everyone can unmute when they want. But what I wanna do is this. I'm going to switch the screens around a little bit. <clears throat> and I'm going to be showing you some images. And I want you to tell me what it is that you can possibly know about the subject from what you see on your screen. And so it'll make more sense as we go along. Okay, so you should see on your screen, um, you should see my picture in the corner and then the apple and then uh, some text on the bottom. The idea is this, what I have up in the corner is a representation of an apple. And if we were in person, what I would do is I would hand you an apple and I would ask you, what can you tell me about an apple having it right there in your hand? And what is it, how can you experience it? For example, um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to put down in there that um, I can know uh, from having an apple in my hand that it is sweet. Okay, so I, because I can taste it, right? I can directly encounter and experience it with the taste sensation. So if you have it in your hand, what else, if you eat it, if you just hold it there, what else can you tell about it having the object right Ooh. there with you? What are, what are some sensual experiences, uh, sight, touch, taste, smell, whatever? What are some other things that we can know having it right there with you? How about something that you know just based on your senses alone? Round. I'm sorry, round? Okay. Or somewhat round. <laughs> I don't see any wormholes in it. Okay. <laughs> Um, we'll say it's whole. Solid. I'm sorry? Solid. Solid. Okay. Because it's, it's in your hand, you can tell that it's solid, right? Okay. It's red. It's red. It's hanging on a tree. 
Okay. In this case, ignore the fact that it's on a tree, pretend you've actually got it there with you. So um, what, how do you experience it when it is right there with you? It's real. Depends whether you're hungry or not. <laughs> <laughs> what about the, the texture or the, the, uh, the surface or the, the, can you smell anything? Any of those things, what would your senses tell you? Move. It's crisp. Crisp. Okay. It's fresh. Firm, smooth. You yeah, don't hear me at all. It's very smooth and shiny. Okay. Mm -hmm. Feels firm. Um. Okay. So with this, with it in your in your grasp, and you um you can encounter it with all of your senses, right? It's something that you can, someone said it's real. And so we experience real based on uh, the five senses. Um, I mean, that, that's, I think it's safe to just kind of leave it that way. We talk about other possible senses, but um, those are kind of up to debate, but we're talking about um, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. And so when we put those to bear on the real thing, um, we can really encounter it and it becomes something that I feel like this is something that I can believe in its existence. I know about it. Uh, I can explore it. I, I can learn things about it because I'm here with it. Oh, now, here's what I want to do next. We'll, we'll, we're going to go to the next image and I want you to tell me what you can't know anymore based on the changed image. So I'm going to go to... Let's see. Okay, so now let's say instead of you having the apple in your hand, and I, I just ask you to kind of go with me on this again. If we were in person, it would be a little different, but now I want you to think of this in terms of, I just handed you this photograph. So if I gave you this two-dimensional photograph, then what on that list would we then need to take away in terms of um, what can we not determine from a photograph? It's not solid. It's not solid. We can't smell it and we can't feel it for okay. texture. Okay. We can't taste it. I'm sorry? We can't taste it either. We can't taste it. So we, we say that it, it, it's not sweet, right? We have our memory to depend on. I'm sorry, one more time. We have our memory to depend on. Right. I mean, we make assumptions instead of reality. True. Now, what if you had never had a, an apple in your hand? What if you had never experienced it directly? This was some foreign fruit from a foreign land. And I said, this is what we call an apple. And it's a photograph. Then what is there anything else here that, that we would have to take away? I, I can't relate to it because it's not tangible. Okay, okay. I'm going to say that I can't know that it's crisp because it's, you know, it's another one of those things where I can't really um, experience it in terms of texture or hardness. Uh, I'm going to say that I don't really know that it's fresh because it could be rotten on the other side. Um, you know, all I know is I've just got this two-dimensional representation. It kind of does look smooth. And it kind of does look shiny. So there, there's a certain amount of, of lost fidelity in a way here, because when we're moving away from the real thing to a photograph, there, there's less that you can determine, right? All right, let's go another le level deep here. Okay, let's say in this case, it's a drawing, you know, or, a, you know, in this case, it, it's a digital representation. So then, what else on this list do you have to take away? If this is all you know, then if this is all I, all you have, I say, look, this is an apple. Then what do we have to take away now? Round. It's round? Okay. Yeah. Real. It's real, yeah, you, it's not real anymore. It's not sweet. It's not sweet, right? I would say that 
it looks as much like a cherry as an apple. So I'm just going to have to take your word that it's an apple because it looks right. like a cherry to at, me. At this point, it's almost it's it's nature has started to elude us because okay, well, it, I don't know that it's smooth. It could be rough. This is not a very this is not an HD kind of representation in terms of what I can tell about it, and it certainly doesn't look shiny. I don't see any reflection on there. So so based on that, I'd have to take away shiny, mm -hmm. and as far oh, as I'm sorry. Solid. Solid. Yeah. I mean, it, it's flat. We don't know how solid it is. Take away fresh. Okay. I'm sorry. Take away fresh. Yeah. Take away fresh. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. It's not coming through on the screen. I tried to uh, put a, a little line through it, but, but yeah, pretty much all we can say is that it, it's red, red and it's still kind of round. Mm -hmm. And so what happens with each layer of, of abstraction or, or each layer, we're taking away senses, we're taking away our ability to experience the reality of that this represents. And I keep thinking about reality this year in terms of we want to know the truth, we want to know what's real, and people are doubting some of those things. So we're taking layers of reality and experience away here. So I'm gonna to go to the next one here, and then we're gonna say, okay, here we have a word representing the thing. So it's another layer back. Can we say that it's red? No, no idea. Can we say that it's whole? I don't know, maybe it's part. I, you can't tell from just the word, right? The only way that we could tell anything about this now would be from previous experience where we'd had the word apple defined and or by direct uh, inspiration from the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what an apple is. Yeah. yeah. yeah we, we don't even know from this if it's a fruit or what it is. It might not even be, uh, uh, might be a rock. Right. <laughs> we don't know from the word apple. Yeah. Word. It might be a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't even sure what language it's from. Well, see, now that was something I was going to bring up, Richard. I'm glad you did say that because in a sense, I, I might say, well, it's easy to pronounce. I might be safe in assuming that it is something known by people who speak my language because it, it appears to be in English characters and it looks like it's something that I can pronounce. You know, there are some languages that are a whole lot more vowels or a whole lot more consonants than we have. It, I would say maybe the people of my culture and language are, are familiar with it, but that's still kind of a guess. So all we have is just the spelling and we might be able to say it looks like it's an English word. We're gonna go one last step further. <laughs> this is the international phonetic spelling of the word representing the real thing. So here, you don't even know what language it is. This is a matter of international symbolism in terms of this is how you could pronounce it. And notice the little mark, the little apostrophe there, the little tick mark there um, that is uh, indicating an accent on the first syllable. But other than that, we know very little. It's basically, here are some sounds for you. And that's about all we can know. So. What's the point? Well, we started with something that we felt was real. And we, we felt it was real because literally our senses could determine things about it. And, and we said, okay, I have a, a bunch of different sensory organs in my body that are giving me information. And, and I feel like I now know this thing. Okay, now let's try the same process and go in reverse. Okay, so I'm going to go with this. This, it depends on your linguistic ability, but it doesn't really look like English. It doesn't really look so much uh, like even English characters. Um, and you know what? I'm going to uh, switch back to the other um, video mode. Um, bear with me for just a moment here. It, it's basically a, some combination of letters, right? I mean, it, it represents something. We have no idea what, but it's completely abstract to us. Um, anyone have a clue what it might represent? Looks like a Greek word, maybe. 
Okay. Yeah. It looks like, you know, this is one of those times for the classic phrase. It looks like Greek to me because <laughs> this is, a, you know, they're Greek letters. It's a Greek word. So let's take a look at this. What does it represent? Well, it's the Greek word for Jesus. So what do we now know that we didn't before? Well, those of us who don't speak Greek can at least pronounce it. However, we don't know who it's about. It could be Jesus. It could be a neighbor. It could be a friend. We really don't know anything other than it's a collection of English letters that we can pronounce. And that pronunciation is going to vary depending on context. Is it Jesus? Is it Jesus? We don't know. Well, it would be nice if from here I could say, well, you know, let's look at a picture. Here's a picture of Jesus. Well, this is kind of a good time for that little broken picture that you see all over the internet when someone's web page programming didn't work out so well. It says image not found. And so here's a nice little portrait, a nice little frame with our picture of Jesus, but oops, we don't happen to have a Polaroid. You know, the, the apostles always ran out of film at the worst time. So we don't have any kind of, you know, pictorial record of Jesus. Now we've got lots of paintings. We've got lots of ideas. So often he's a, a German dude with long blonde hair. Um, but really, you know, if we want to, to be realistic about it, he was Middle Eastern and he didn't look anything like, you know, the, the common representations of him. So what did he look like? Well, I don't know. And you don't know. So what does that do for us in terms of our experience of him? Well, what about that apple? What if I didn't like the color red? Maybe I wouldn't be too keen on apples. What if I didn't care for sweet? I was more of a salty person. And maybe again, I don't really care for apples. There could be elements of that experience where um, I don't really enjoy um, you know, what's coming through those senses. So I, I kind of think it's nice that we don't know what Jesus looked like because all of us have different tastes in terms of what's good looking, what's not, what, what's handsome. You know, what, it, I think it kind of works well for us that we don't know. And if we were to go to the next level, well, okay, at least we have scripture, right? That can tell us a bit about who this Jesus person was. And there's a whole layer of complexity in terms of the information that we can get from there, right? We can, we have prophecy that would tell us who is this Jesus who is to come? And, and this spoke to the people of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, uh, still speaks to us today. That prophecy talks about the one who would come and uh, what he would accomplish. We have the narratives in terms of this is what happened in his life. Uh, Jesus went here and this happened. He went there and then this happened. And so it, it's a narrative um, collection of stories, uh, true stories of what happened in his life. And those go along with the biography in the sense of this is when he was born. Um, this was, these were his parents. Uh, this was the culture he grew up in. All of those kinds of things work together to give us, for lack of a better term, a picture of who he was. Then we have the letters, the epistles. You know, uh, Paul was writing about um, his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He would write about what Jesus taught him. And so in the letters, there is witnessing to who Jesus was. And so that, that gives us something where we don't, we can't experience him with our five senses in the same way that the apostles did when they were walking with him. And then we have the gospels. And the gospels are so rich and so important to us because they are Jesus' own words. They are him revealing himself. They're him revealing the Father, especially in the book of John. And they are Jesus revealing the Holy Spirit to us. So Jesus is the one who reveals God, and there is self-revelation. And so thanks to scripture, we can know a lot about Jesus. We can know a lot about God. But do you know where I'm going to go with this? If I say we know a lot about God, then can I know him directly in the same way that I can know about an apple by reading about it, by seeing a picture? 
um, by, by hearing people tell stories about it. But if I have never held one in my hand, is it real to me? How do I experience a thing that I can't touch or taste or smell or see or hear? Is that a challenge to me in terms of how I experience that thing or this person as real? And I would argue that it is this last level of experiencing God that matters the most. Now, everything else can lead us up here, and it is certainly helpful. But I can't say from reading scripture that I know God personally. What I what I can hope for is that it will lead me to a better relationship. But I need to have those moments where I experience him directly in order to say, I know the Lord. I know Jesus. So what does this picture represent? Well, we have to fall back on images at this point. However, the reason for a lot of those prayer exercises we were doing was to take us to the point where we had the apple in our hand, so to speak, where we experienced Jesus directly. So I want you to look at this picture and I want you to imagine that you are somewhere out in the country on vacation and you're going for a walk and um, you kind of come around a corner in the in the the, the walk here and you you come across this sunrise it's striking and it, it's that sunburst effect of light bursting forth amidst things that are kind of in the way and, and it's the kind of thing that it would be striking enough that you would stop and you'd say wow that's that's beautiful or at least I know I would if, if I was walking along and I saw this I would say wow, that, that's something. And I'd probably want to take out my phone and try to get a picture of it. They wouldn't come out anything like this. Um, so the, the idea here being that in that moment, if you were there, something would strike your awareness to say, I kind of think that I feel the presence of God. Or at least that, that often happens when we're out in nature, when we see something beautiful, right? Now imagine, just imagine for a moment, if you don't like fishing, don't worry about it. That's not the point. But imagine that you love to go fishing. You are out there in this boat and you are in this person's position and you have this scene in front of you. Imagine that you are looking up at the sun bursting forth through those clouds and you see that mirrored glass reflection there. That's awe inspiring. And I don't know about you, but when that kind of thing happens to me, it really, it wakes me up from whatever I was doing before, and I start to really think about God. It, it takes away the little things of, of life, it takes away my little concerns, and I think, my goodness, God, I forgot you were here. You know, I, I have been so consumed by other things thank you for reminding me of your presence. Something that's stunning like this, almost overwhelming to the visual senses, is just amazing. Not to mention probably a breeze and, and smells, the whole experience there. Now imagine you were on this lake and you were in a little boat and you were in that one spot where the sun is shining through the clouds like a spotlight. What would you think? you'd kind of feel like this is probably not a coincidence. The realization that God is with us is what is so important. And sometimes it's a, it's a fishing trip. It's a mountaintop experience. It is those moments when you feel his presence or when he speaks to you or brings to you a moment of clarity where you understand something you didn't understand before. There, there's this light of, of insight. There is this, uh, I, I just know he's here. There is maybe a word comes to mind, or maybe it, it's the image. You don't need an image. You are surrounded by the image that you need. But there is a moment when you recognize the presence of God and he is communicating with you. That, to me, is the moment when you're holding the apple. And so the idea of these practices has been to facilitate that holding the apple experience. And it doesn't matter to me 
what practice anyone uses as long as it's helpful to them. And so if it's the out on the walk on the trail or in a boat or you know out by a lake or or whatever it may be, the magic is in the experience, it's in the encounter. And so that's what I so hope and pray for for all of us that direct encounter with God, not just knowing about, not just hearing stories, but I know because I have experienced directly the person of God. Another sunset, another one of those times that just inspires you to think about God. Um, another one here where it almost has the appearance where it looks like the sun is bursting forth from inside the clouds. And we know that the the sun is millions of miles away, but it has this effect on us. And Jesus knows exactly what images, what sounds, what words are going to have an effect on us. And the Holy Spirit can take that and run with it in a way that we suddenly put two and two together in a way that we never did before. And suddenly we have been touched by God and we don't, we don't come away the same. This results in the joy of knowing a God who loves us and that the peace that he loves us and doesn't want to be God without us. And so when we talk about Advent being a time of joy, that joy comes from being with God and that with God life comes from consistent encounters where we share the place with God, where we share our, our space, our, our, our hopes, our dreams, our thoughts, our feelings, our angst, our worries, our concerns, all of those things we, we share with him in a relationship because it is a real relationship with a real person. And sometimes we need these reminders to put us back into that place to have that joy of a life with God. Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. You see this apple idea. You can't taste without experiencing it directly. So the psalmist says, take and see, taste and see that the Lord is good. And though you have not seen him, you love him. This is in 1 Peter. And even though you don't now see him, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Remember, salvation isn't just about, oh good, I'm not going to hell. Salvation means I am saved from a without God life. I am saved into a with God life then that results in an inexpressible and glorious joy, knowing that our souls, our very being, is locked and secure in the heart of God. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15 literally thank God for the Holy Spirit, because it is he who brings this awareness to us. It's not just the sunset or the sunrise or the amazing view. It is the Holy Spirit saying, hey, do you know who sent that to you? We did. That's God sending you that in the moment to remind you that we're here and we love you more than you know. John 16, so with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. Christ had to die and then return and he will come again and has come again with that second layer of Advent. He is with us and no one will take away our joy. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, of peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14. Not only is joy something that would be nice to embrace, not only is it something that we need to have the guts to search after, but it is a matter of life in the kingdom. It is part of our existence with God. It is normal. If you want to talk about a new normal, let this be our new normal. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That had to be quite 
a, a, a carrot. You know, we talk about a carrot and a stick, the motivation and the punishment. For Jesus to endure what he went through, there had to be supreme joy at the result of it, the accomplishment, which would be reconciliation with all of God's children. That brings about joy in Jesus, and he shares that with us. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It all comes back to this, our theme for the, the, the summer, for the year, this is eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is life. Everything else leads up to it, surrounds it, uh, um, supports it, but real life comes from knowing God directly and personally. And don't make any mistake, I don't mean to say that scripture and the Bible are not important at all. I mean, they are a means to an end to know God himself. It doesn't say this is eternal life, that they would memorize the words that I, that I speak and that I hear. It says that they know you, and the Bible is there that we would know the living God. So he invites us, as he always does, to be with him. He extends a hand. He, he says, I am going to draw you close. I am going to pull you in and I'm going to quiet those fears that I don't love you. I'm going to quiet those fears that I don't forgive you. I'm going to remind you that I am always here for you. I am your biggest fan, your biggest cheerleader. I am for you and nothing is going to come between us. This is the Jesus who wants to be with us. This is the Jesus who became Emmanuel, God with us, always and forever. So let's take communion together. It's such a tragedy that for so long, many of us, myself included, um, so often saw communion as a commemoration of death, when it is really a commemoration of Jesus' life and his victory and what he accomplished for all of us. Um, it is a matter of restoration and reconciliation. So we take the, the bread and the wine or the, the bread and the juice, whatever it is, as symbols of what he did in terms of making all of this possible and bringing us back into the fold. So we thank him for that. Let's pray a blessing on these elements. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for constantly reaching out to us, for being with us in the difficult times and in the good times. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior and our Lord, the Lord who teaches us how to live, and teaches us that to live is to be with you. And thank you that the Holy Spirit dwells within us, makes us a, a temple that you, you are living inside of us somehow that we don't quite understand, but it doesn't matter. We thank you that you love us so much that you went to all of this expense of Christ's death, his sacrifice, but that he made it so that we stand before you blameless and pure because our sins are covered, the, the relationship is restored, and we now participate in your ministry, your gospel, your evangelism to the world of your love. So we thank you so, so much for all of it. And we pray for your blessing on these elements, these symbols in Jesus' name. Amen.